Look, I don't want to go all zen in the art of portfolio maintenance on you. But when it comes to managing your own money, you are often your own worst enemy. Don't take it personally. I'm my own worst enemy, too. What do I mean by that? Okay, if you want to invest wisely, you constantly need to be fighting off your own worst impulses. We're not robots. We have emotions, and those emotions can really throw you off your game. That's why the theme of tonight's show is that discipline trumps conviction. You obey the rules so that you do the smart thing, even when your emotions are telling you to do the opposite. Which brings me to my next rule for investing. Nobody ever made a dime panicking. Yet panic, you should repeat after me, frankly, it's not a strategy. Panic is not a strategy. Yet you see it over and over again as if it is. A stock gets hammered, then investors sell after the hammering. The market gets crushed on a huge day. People bail at the end of the day. In short, something gets annihilated and people can't take the pain. So they bowl. Panic is the operating instinct in all of these cases. There's something basic and instinctive about panic, about the desire to flee. If you're a Stone Age hunter-gatherer who accidentally stumbles into a family of grizzly bears, well, panic can be pretty helpful. But uh, it tells you to run away. But it's not a useful emotion when it comes to analyzing the stock market where you're running away when maybe you should be running toward. The truth is there will almost always be a better time to sell than in a panic, a better time to leave the table than whatever moment inspired you to panic in the first place. And don't I know it. Back in 2010, I was on the air for the flash crash when the market fell 900 points in less than a half hour. I watched the monitor for the ticker, the crawl that's underneath the picture, and I couldn't believe what was happening. People were dumping stock simply because everyone else was dumping stock. They didn't even know why they were dumping it. And that's what a panic looks like. That's textbook. I urge viewers right there on the set to pick a stock they loved and buy it using limit orders so you wouldn't have to accept a price you didn't like. The result? To this day, people still come up to me and thank me for that advice during the flash crash. But I simply put my rule into practice, realizing that nobody ever made a dime panicking, and then I tried to help you profit from it. I did the same thing back in 2016 when we had a thousand point sell off over two days. I told people to buy down, but only using limit orders. And that's what we did for the charitable trust, which you can follow by joining the ActionLearnsPlus.com club. We got outstanding buys simply because we stayed calm and took advantage of everyone else's panic. So the next time there's a big market wide sell off and you feel like fleeing and never touching a stock again, I want you to do something for me. I want you to take the opposite side of your emotions, the opposite side of the trade. When you see one of those high-speed routes of a sector or even individual stock, why not buy a little? Get a feel for it. See what I mean. The most rewarding trades you can make are those where the decks have been cleared out by terrified folks using market orders. Sell, sell, sell who they don't get that the exit doors aren't as big as they think they are. Mind you, I'm not absolutely saying that, well, you just buy every stock and every panic, every sell-off. They're not all worth buying. Often when people freak out about an individual company, it could be with good reason. But I am saying that it's a rare moment when you won't get some sort of bounce after big decline. So the next time you want to dump everything, take a deep breath and wait for the rebound before you sell, rather than rushing to join the fleeing masses. You could get trampled. Hey, speaking of hideous down days, I've got another rule that can help you handle big declines. Ready? When the stock market gets unrelentingly negative, remember that he who defends everything defends nothing. Now, it was true when Frederick the Great said it 250 years ago, and it's just as true now. Granted, he was talking about battle plans, and we're talking about portfolio plans, but the point stands. So he who defends everything defends nothing. What exactly does that mean? It's about how you evaluate your holdings. When the market's flying and many stocks are in bull market mode, you don't need to worry about most of your positions. More exposure to the bull, the better, right? But when things get more difficult, when you're on the defensive, you need to recognize that many of the stocks you bought during better times might not fit the new environment. In short, when the economy's slowing and the market's getting slammed, you can't hang on to everything you might want to own. If you try to defend all of your positions in a market that turns against you, that's a recipe for you to get blown out of the stock market. And when I say defend, I mean you can't treat a declining market like it's a buying opportunity in every single stock in your portfolio and you just keep chipping away. If you do that, you'll quickly run out of capital. Anyone would, leaving you unprepared to buy more if we do go lower, maybe even appreciably lower. 
Yep, when the market gets negative, you need to get more selective, focus your efforts. That's why I rank all my stocks at all times for my ActionAlertsPlus.com club members. Ones are stocks that I buy right now. Twos are stocks I buy in a weakness. Threes are stocks I'd sell, maybe into strength. That way I'll know which stocks I should defend when things get tough. I make this plan not in the heat of battle. And then I, I know which ones to cut or use as sources of capital to buy the ones. Let's say tech's getting hammered, but you think it's going to rebound. It's important that you don't try to hang on to the whole complex. Pick the best tech stocks that you'll want to buy in the weakness. Toss out the rest to raise cash. Use those newfound cash reserves to buy the stocks of higher quality tech companies at lower prices. That's right, the non-essentials, the ones that have no catalyst and you only own because you wanted exposure to a bull market, they get the heave-ho immediately when things turn bearish. Karen Kramer, who worked with me for years at my old hedge fund, used to call this circling the wagons around your best names. The first few times you do it, you'll curse yourself because you might end up slaughtering stocks that you've owned for quite some time. But eventually, after you experience a number of rough markets, you'll realize just how valuable this process is because over time, you'll end up with great cost bases on the stocks you really like. The bottom line, great investors know how to ignore their emotions when those emotions get in the way of making money. So the next time the market gets slammed, don't panic. Nobody ever made a dime by panicking. But also don't double down just with your eyes closed and the whole portfolio in the weakness. Vicious negative markets can give you buying opportunities, but you need to focus your capital on your absolute favorites rather than chasing bargains in lower quality merchandise when it turns out they weren't bargains at all. Rich in New York, Rich. Hi, Mr. Kramer. Uh, It's a pleasure. How are you? you? Please explain. I'm good. Thank you. Could you please explain uh, the technique of buying calls and if it could be or should be used by us home gamers to boost or pad our portfolios? Hey, look, it's a great question. The Nigerian brothers, I don't know if you've ever seen them. They've done some fabulous work on options, and there's also options actions on Friday afternoon. They are they could be a low-risk way to be able to limit your exposure. And if you get the book, Getting Back to Even, I have a 100-page exposition of how to use calls to limit your uh, downside and get maximum upside exposure. Getting Back to Even. David in California. David. Booyah, Jim Cramer. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, I'm glad you called. Thanks. Uh, All right, so a quick question. For millennials who are somewhat knowledgeable about the market, where should they invest their money other than FANG? Well, you know what? There's a lot of different FANG-like names in all sorts of different uh, industries. For instance, I like aerospace. That's a long-term bull market. Maybe you get something in that group. I like a, far, a little bit of foreign exposure, and I think that that's not such a bad idea. Maybe an ETF that has Europe, because Europe is way behind where we are and will be that way for multiple years. And then I think that, you know what? If you're really young, why not look at some riskier biotech stocks? Got your whole life to make that money back. All right. Remember, emotions have no place in investing. They get in the way of making money. So the next time the market gets slammed, please don't panic. Nobody ever made a dime by panicking. Sell us can give you huge opportunities. Bye, 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 bye. But you need to do your homework. Don't chase and don't buy damaged merchandise, just damaged stocks. May have money's back after the break. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.